Islam. So we're back, and I just wanted to um, give a give a short introduction because this is a very long definition. But we're uh, on page 369 of Black's Law uh, Dictionary, fourth edition. On the left hand side of the page, it says, "In criminal law, all right, a voluntary confession. In criminal law, a voluntary statement made by a person charged with the commission of a crime or misdemeanor, communicated to another person, wherein he acknowledges himself to be guilty." of the offense charged and discloses the circumstances of the act or the share and participation which he had in it. All right. Also the act of a prisoner when arraigned for a crime or misdemeanor is acknowledging and avowing that he is guilty of the offense charged. Confession comprises whole criminal charge wherein admission relates only to particular fact or circumstance covered thereby. All right. So, you know, these individuals, similar to this, to what's going on in, in chapter 15 of the Red Book here, um, you know, you're talking about scienter or a guilty mind or malice. Oftentimes, you know, in, in criminology, you know, they, they say that the, that the uh, criminal will return to the scene of the crime. All right. And, you know, the guilty conscience will, will, will force them to confess if there's any. If there's any moral turpitude, they will admit their wrongs, you know, seek a recompense and, you know, seek to do right. But if they're filled with pride and selfishness, greed, you know, and all those things, the lower self, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, spill the beans too much, but, you know, just, just keep, keep these things in mind. All right. Uh, let me read this again. 14. If one has only reached the plane of treachery, he is a lover of deceit and will betray a friend to save his selfish self. Behold, you men, or whatsoever you be, your, your words fall lightly on my ears. 16. Can I prejudge these hundred priests, turn traitor to myself and them because of what you say when you confess your treachery? All right. The same ones who claim to follow, love, and honor prophet will confess their very hatred and contempt for what the prophet has brought them by their very actions, words, and deeds. We don't have to look that far. You know, all we got to do is, is use, our, use our, our discernment, you know, use our, our eyes, our spiritual eyes, you know, use our ears to hear and listen to what they're saying. Sometimes we don't even have to look at, at nothing. We can, just, we can just listen to what they're saying and hear it and know that it's not true. All right. And keep in mind, you know, when they when they talk about justice and the you know the scales of Libra, and they say justice is blind, they they often have a blindfold on her. You know what I mean? Because they don't they don't want justice to see what's really going on. But that you know we can we could argue that a number of different ways. But anyway, uh, seventeen. No man can judge for me. Let me re read that again. No man or woman, you know, not you don't want to be sexist. No man can judge for me. And if I judge before testimony is in, I might not judge a right. All right. So make sure that anybody who's passing judgment, make sure that they have all the testimony and that all the testimony has been presented and given, you know, equal chance to be presented and, and weighed. All right. Uh, 18. Nay, men, by whatsoever way you came, return. My soul prefers the darkness of the grave to little flickering light like these you bring. 19. My conscience rules. What these my brothers, what these, comma, my brothers have to say, comma, I will hear. And when the testimony all is in, I will decide. You cannot judge for me, nor I for you. So, you know, 20, be gone. You men be gone and leave to me this charming light. For while the sun shines not within my soul, there is a light surpassing that of the sun and moon and that of the moon. Pardon me, let me read this again. Be gone. You men be gone and leave to me this charming light. For while the sun shines not within my soul, Within my soul, there is a light surpassing that of sun and moon. Talking about that, that I lie in man, right? 20, 
two. Again, the white robe priest appeared. Let me back up. 21, pardon me. 21, then with an angry threat that they would do him harm. Typically, when you know, when you when you reveal the truth, you know, when you're doing the work, and they they realize they can't stop it, they'll try to slow it down. And then when you rebuke them, you know, for, for trying to tempt you, then they'll try to send you angry threats and, you know, want to threaten your, you and everything. And, you know, I've dealt with moors who want to pop off real crazy and talk all tough. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, they're, they're just expressing an angry threat similar to what these, these false priests did. All right. With Yoshua. Okay. You know. And I do mean overkill. That's that's what's going on. Overkill. Over, okay means overkill. But, you know, you really don't want to get into that because that goes into the MK Ultra Mind program and all that good stuff. Um, and we're not really dealing with that today. But, you know, we can get into it if y'all got questions or comments. Send us an email. Uh, but 21, then with an angry threat that they would do him harm, the vile tempters left and Yoshua was alone. 22, again, the white robe priest appeared and led the way. And Yehoshua stood again before the Hierophat. 23, and not a word was said, but in his hand, the master placed a scroll on which the word justice was inscribed. 24, and Yoshua was the master of the phantom forms of prejudice and treachery. Islam, and I think that's what we're dealing with oftentimes when we're talking about this electrifying age, you know, dealing with the troll shields, um, you know, and bots, all right? We're dealing with the phantom forms of prejudice and of treachery. All right. Because they're, they're prejudiced against others who they're, you know, they're trying to say they're separate or, or different from. And then they're treacherous, not only to themselves, but to, you know, Allah in man and, and the Allah or the God within the, their own selves. Because they're, you know, instead of honoring and respecting that, they're dwelling in their lower selves and acting out of, you know, hate, you know, lewdness. You know, thoughts of, of murderous and treachery and theft. All right. All those things are the lowest up that we were talking about earlier. All right. But just just to back up. Um, 15, chapter 15, verse 15, circle seven says, but Jesus said, away from me, all tempting thoughts. My heart is fixed. I spurn this carnal self with all its vain ambition and its pride. Islam. And then 15, chapter 15, verse 15 of the Red Book says, Behold, you men, or whatsoever you be, your words fall lightly on my ears. Why do they fall lightly on my ears? Because you're tempting, you're, you, you know, these tempting thoughts that you're given. And you know my heart is fixed. I'm spurning these carnal, these carnal desires of self. All right, with all this vain ambition and his pride. I'm not dealing with that. Islam, so we're back. Um, and just to switch gears here, I just wanted to pull something out of the administrative functions real quick. I might, you know, jump back into it, but, uh, on the section of the cherub, all right, talking about the sergeant at arms or the doorkeeper, all right, uh, five on page 72 here, it says the doorkeeper shows our temple visitors great and cordial hospitality. They show where restrooms are, they get water for the visitors, they hang up coats, they answer all questions, they give out information of future meetings, ETC, and they escort dignitaries who are visiting our more society. These two are the task of the sergeant at arms or doorkeepers. All right. Six, the sergeant at arms being mufti enforces the laws of our more society and maintains peace at any cost. The sergeant at arms is also in charge of our charter, comma, the symbol of our legislative power and authority. They are to see that the flags are at all times respected and protected. Remember the subversive act of George Washington and his use of the acts regarding the cherry tree. Seven, main seven, maintaining the general overall security of the temple building, the meetings, and the congregation is his slash her major responsibility. All right. Eight. A letter of introduction is to be made to the county sheriff, sheriff or sheriff and to the local police department notifying them of our Moorish society having peace officers operating in accord with our Moorish laws, rules, and customs. All right. 
Nine, the office of the sergeant at arms or doorkeeper shall be shall hold the responsibility to keep the temple property and the temple regalia etc secured and in good order they must keep the temple clean orderly decent warm or cool and comfortable at the close of the meetings they shall assure that all temple property is properly secured and if any property instruments or items are ever removed from the temple for an outside function it is the responsibility of the assigned officer responsible to that charge to secure the return of the same Islam so let me just pause and we are gonna move on to some more demonstrations here so just hold with me Islam so we're back um, and at this time I want to reiterate and discuss you know for for peer review um, the topic of consular court because it seems and I've been getting word that there's a, there's a lot of confusion that's being spread about what consular courts are and what they mean and you know this that and the third so uh, let me read from civic lesson book number 14 a1 and we're at page 8 starting about the middle of the page uh, and the term consul it says consul a wazir officer consul or minister representative of a nation who is appointed or assigned the duty of the overseer of the nation's relationship with another nation concerning the citizens mercantile economics etc the consul or consuls generally report to a higher consul officer slash minister who is called consul general consular courts consular courts generally deal with civil cases and in some instances having criminal jurisdiction consular courts are held by consuls of one nation slash country in the territory or jurisdiction of another nation slash country these courts are operated under the authority of treaties which are constitutionally enforced Islam all parties must be lawfully identified with documented proof of nationality and citizenship and documented proof of sovereign authority to enforce the law constitution of the people do not go beyond this paragraph if you do not understand it this is your key Islam so if you don't understand what I just read stop right here rewind play it again you know go do some research alright but let's continue for those who you know those more scholars who who get it alright the descendants of Moroccans born in the Americas the Moorish Americans should refer to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787 between Morocco and the United States of America remember the European Christians are foreigners settled in your land this is your home Moors as consular courts were abolished and this is on page 9 as consular courts were abolished in 1956 AD 1376 Moorish calendar year all issues between the Moors and European Christians being of a treaty nature are obviously of a federal jurisdiction all right the states cannot make treaties and therefore have no jurisdiction a change of venue should automatically be recognized uh, should be automatically recognized by inferior courts any jurisdiction claim without mutual agreement within the prescribed proper forum is void of law federal and state officials must set up court, consular courts to have lawful jurisdiction in Moorish affairs where provisions are not made to address foreign relations and intercourse in a consular court as prescribed by law comma then no jurisdiction exists all right if there's no consular courts to deal with the foreign relations and intercourse you know and to, to answer to and you know deal with the the treaty obligations of each party all right then no jurisdiction exists a court of general sessions congressionally sanctioned in accord with the national constitutions and treaties with consulars and officials representing both nations slash nationals present and in pro persona mind you the Congress of Germany Sinadia 1861 all right so if the Congress of Germany Sinadia 1861 and then we fast forward 
1956, and then 19, you know, the Casa Courts, or the, or pardon me, the U.S. dot relief and jurisdiction of the Casa Courts in Morocco. All right, and then them recognizing the Kingdom of Morocco over there in the Kibbalan, but not the rest of the empire over here. All right, you got to keep in mind where Morocco really is. All right, what part of Morocco are they talking about when they say, you know, other territories of the, of the uh, former Ottoman Empire? Hold on, pardon me. So let me let me back up further, and actually I'm I'm gonna read the full text. All right, and this is a copy here, facsimile of. AA two two one four one, which is which is referenced by Brother C M Bay, and on on notice and on the record, on the public record, part of the congressional records at the Library of Congress. All right, and it says here one forty one to carry into full effect the provisions. So to carry into full effect means to activate, to be active, not passive. All right, the prov and in the provisions of the treaties of the United States with certain foreign countries. The ministers and consuls. So note the ills and bays, they're ministers, but we're talking about the consul part, all right? Consuls of the United States and China, Siam, Turkey, Morocco, Muscat, Abyssinia, Persia, and territories formerly a part, formerly a part of the former Ottoman slash Moorish Empire, including Egypt. Duly appointed to reside therein shall, in addition to other powers and duties imposed upon them, respectively, by the provisions of such treaties. Keep in mind, the treaties are what's guiding here. All right. This is what's guiding foreign relations and intercourse. All right. Respectively, be invested with judicial authority described in sections, in the list of sections. All right which shall appertain to the office of minister and consul and be a part of the duties belonging thereto wherein and so far as the same is allowed by treaty again the limits of the treaty all right keep that in mind this is what this is what's determining how things are, are being decided and in accordance with the usages of the countries in their intercourse with the franks and other foreign christian nations all right and keep in mind, this treaty of peace and friendship was between the Moors and these foreign Christian nations. All right. 142, general jurisdiction in criminal cases, the officers mentioned in section 141. So that's the ministers and consuls. These are officers that we're talking about. All right. Mentioned in section 141 of this title are fully empowered to arraign and try in the manner provided in sections, blah, 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 right? It gives it to you right here. All citizens of the United States charged with offenses against law come committed in such countries respectively and to sentence such offenders in the manner and in such sections authorized and each of them is authorized to issue all such processes as are suitable and necessary to carry this authority into execution. So not only do they have the the, the they're, are they fully empowered to arraign and try? They're also empowered to uh, come up with those, and they're authorized to issue all those processes as are suitable and necessary. And notice it says processes in here, but anyway, we'll just keep that in mind. Uh, as are suitable and necessary to carry this authority into execution. All right. 143, general jurisdiction in civil cases. Semicolon, venue. Such officers are also invested with all the judicial authority necessary to execute the provisions of such treaties, respectively, in regard to civil rights, whether of property or person, and they shall enter, entertain jurisdiction in matters of contract, comma, at the port where or nearest to which the contract was made, or at the port at which or nearest to which it was to be executed. All right, keep in mind these ports. All right, and again, the limits of the treaty. All right. Uh, at the port where or nearest to where it, the cause of controversy arose or at the port where or nearest to which the damage complained of was sustained, provided such port be one of the ports at which the United States are represented by consuls. All right. Such jurisdiction shall embrace all controversy between citizens of the United States or others provided for 
by such treaties respectively. All right. So they're talking about the consular courts being the proper venue for those citizens of the United States or others or others. Others is a very broad statement. Very, very broad. Provided for by such treaties respectively. So what treaty might we be talking about? All right. What treaties could we possibly be talking about? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the Treaty of Peace and Friendship 1787. All right. And let me let me get into some of the language of the treaty. Hold on. So pardon me before I get into that. Uh, before I get into the language of the treaty, I just want to keep reading here. We're back in lesson book 14A1. All right, still still on page nine. Let me back up. It says, as consular courts were abolished in 1956 AD, 1376 Moorish calendar year, all issues between Moors and European Christians being of a treaty nature are obviously of a federal jurisdiction. The state cannot, cannot, the state cannot make treaties and therefore have no jurisdiction. All right. This is why the federal jurisdiction is, is really, you know, the beginning, middle, and end for Moors, right? But let's just, do, let's, let's just back up and just talk about realities of things, all right? Um, if, you, if you go to federal court right now to faint, file a claim or file charges against someone, last time I checked, it was like 400 notes, all right? 400 fiat notes, all right? Now, you can compare that just for, just for the sake of, of you know, doing the math to 85 notes which is what we're you know we're offering for Moors to bring their charges to consular court now via facepropensregency.org all right and to get you know get their claims on the dockets all right versus 400 so you know now two you want to keep in mind um and let me pull up this definition right quick hold on one second all right so when we're talking about consular courts, when we're talking about you know the difference between federal and state and all of that good stuff, um, for Moors, right? Based on this treaty and, and the intercourses that we're we're interacting with these Europeans and these you know these foreign corporate uh, policies and corporations, the consular court would in fact be what's known as a court of first instance. All right, court of first instance, and this is Black Law Fourth Edition. All right. Page 430, I'm over here on the right-hand side of the page. Court of first instance, a court of primary jurisdiction. Courts of this title may be found in the jurisprudence of the Philippine Islands. Islam. Uh, let me just jump down. Court of General Sessions. The name given in some states to a court of general original jurisdiction in criminal cases. Alright? So if you just want to, if you truly want to distinguish between consular court and you know, uh, court of general sessions. Traditionally, consular court uh, dealt with civil issues because it became the court of the maritime jurisdiction. All right, in modern context. All right, and you're talking about what's going on between you know on the Morrison State right now. We we are dealing with mercantile, you know, law of the sea problems, oftentimes. Um, and then the Court of General Sessions for sake of conversation would, would strictly handle criminal cases but according to section 141 or a, rather 142 um, of what I just read pardon me I can't find it right now got too much stuff in, my, in front of me but that court can the Council Court under 142 can handle criminal cases as well as under 43 handle civil alright and so that that covers the bulk of what you what you're dealing with when you're talking about law, all right. And you're talking about you know what court what ty what type of courts and, and things of, of that sort. Now keep in mind, um, which they didn't go into in in this definition here, but a court of, a court of first instance, all right. When you're talking about the appeals process, anything that's decided in that court of first instance or or that first court where you filed everything, if you get a, a final judgment and you're appealing it. Whatever facts, whatever law has been decided, all right, that is considered a moot point at that point, right? Now we could we could leave people to their own devices and, and leave the, the situation as it is, where every more you know has to step up and you know get right with the with the writs and everything, and then they write their writs, and the writs, of course, you know, you got to go through that whole you know rigmarole. 
But what often happens is that morals are either not getting responses or they're not, you know, they're not getting a favorable reply. Um, or the courts or the, or the, you know, the tribunals and whatnot, they're just railroading them. All right. And Moors are left hung out to dry. Literally. <laughs> Rolled hard, put up wet, and hung out to dry. All right. And a lot of times Moors don't really know the law, so they don't, they don't really see in that process how things are supposed to go. But when you're talking about a court of first instance, all right, if that first court decided that you are, you know, a purple people eater, once you get to appeal, we don't have to argue whether or not you're a purple people eater because that's already been decided. You know, you had your chance to rebut it, rebut the claim. You either did or you didn't, you know. And keep in mind that whatever rebuttal you make in that court of first instance preserves that issue on appeal. All right. So that's why you have to object to certain things. You have to speak out on certain things. Otherwise, you'll fall into a position known as estoppel. Pardon me. Islam. So when we're talking about estoppel, realize that it's, it's a very, very long definition. It's about, about three, four pages. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Almost, almost eight sections. All right. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna be real brief here. Estoppel. All right. And this is this may be a new concept for some people, but I, I really need you guys to get this in mind. This will help clear up a lot of confusion. All right. Estoppel. A man's own act or acceptance stops or closes his mouth to allege or plead the truth. An estoppel arises when one is concluded or forbidden by law to speak against his own act or deed. An inconsistent position, attitude, or course of conduct may not be adopted to loss or injury of another. Islam. So, you know, when you're talking about Council of Court, you're talking about making certain claims, and then you got other people saying, oh no, Council of Court's not the right way to go, you know, don't don't do that, you know. Um, they may realize and recognize, you know, more scholars, they they may be cre you know creating a circumstance or situation where you may be stopped from making certain claims, all right, based on your argument and based on your, your previous deeds and actions or or you know lack of deeds and words or lack of actions all right estoppel may be claimed and this is what sets the stage for what ties always talks about uh which is latches all right for those who understand property law you know or or even torts all right which is you know can can be iterated in modern terms as the statute of limitations islam so if you don't make a certain claim within a certain amount of time all right, you can be a stop from being able to even bring that claim at a later date. And the court has no, there's, there's no obligation to hear your claims at that point. Now, if we're saying that the consular courts in 56, they relinquish jurisdiction, and then all cases, it says in, in the modern you know, connotation, if you look up AA22, or if you look up Title 22, Chapter 2, Section 141 on uh, Cornell's website, the Avalon Project, it'll tell you in there they picked a particular date to relinquish the jurisdiction, and, and that in, by 1960, all cases and controversies had been settled. All right. Now, let's just use our thinking mind here. All right. If I wasn't born in 1956 and I wasn't, you know, competent between that time and 1960 and the Moors who were did not step up, did not bring any claims to the consular courts. The, the U dot S dot is saying, oh, well, we're relinquishing jurisdiction. We're giving it back to you and everything that we, you know, we were handling. We're, we're done with that by 1960. All right. And keep in mind, you know, the previous definition we were talking about gave uh, mention of rights and certain duties. All right. And we're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about slander. You got certain rights and duties. All right. Or you have a certain office that you have to maintain. Otherwise, you know, uh, you may be, again, falling into a position of Estoppel or estoppel in pais. <laughs> All right. So getting back to lesson book 14, uh, A1, let me just read, read this thoroughly. Where provisions are not made to address foreign relations and intercourse in a consular court, as prescribed by law, then no jurisdiction exists. All right. So if they relinquish jurisdiction back to the Moors, and then the Moors are not stepping up and giving or 
giving the law that would express those provisions that would be required to handle the foreign relations and intercourse between, you know, the Moors and the Christian powers. All right. This Franciscan Moor, you know, these Franciscans that we're dealing with, this Franciscan Moorish paradigm that we're, we're in today. All right. Then there is no law. There is no jurisdiction. All right. And at the end of the day, we can we can hem and haw about how we're we're following the law and we're enforcing the Constitution. But if there's no lawful due process, Islam, and uh, shouts out to brother um, Mark El Alim Bay um, for th his demonstration, you know, and, and his build, and he he reiterated to me, uh, brother El Haj Malik El Shabazz made mention um, in a quote, and I'm paraphrasing here: If you stab me in the back, right? You stab me in the back with a knife. And you pull the knife out just a little bit. That's not justice. All right. If you pull the knife out all the way, that still is not justice or lawful due process. Right. You would have to suture up or stitch up the wound, clean it off, make sure it heals up properly. All right. And, and I would I would dare say and then you still have to charge the individual. You know, arraign and try them, give them their sentencing, and then enforce that sentence, be it civil or criminal. All right. And if you stab me, that's, that's a criminal act. All right. I'm going to charge you criminally. <laughs> I, I ain't, I'm not, I'm not going to play with you on the civil end. I'm just going to charge you criminally. That's just me, though. All right. But uh, moving on, re realize if you, if you pull the knife out a little bit, that's, that's not justice. All right, if you pull it out all the way, it's still not justice. You got to clean it up. You got to heal it. Make sure that everything is right. All right. So when we're talking about consular courts and these foreign relations between Moors and whatnot, which I thought I thought part of this movement, what you know, I thought the main part of this movement was uplifting fallen humanity, right? And and like you know, like you see demonstrated here, you got the prophet with the woman, the womb man, and humanity written on her womb, and he's taking her out of the cares of the world. So you see that. The cares of the world, you know, the, the murky ethers on to the, the solid rock of salvation. All right. This is this is symbology of, of what we're supposed to be doing in uplifting fallen humanity. All right. So if, if my if we go, if we go to the this Holy Quran. All right. And we see that. We have certain instructions, all right? We have certain instructions from the prophet that would tell us, you know, how we're supposed to interact, how we're supposed to be dealing with each other, all right? And and what our duties are to each other, all right? Um, but before I do that, let me pause. Hold on. I want to I read something. Islam. So before we get, in, in, we get into that, uh, this chapter 25 here. I wanted to read, um, come out of lesson book five, see if it's lesson book five or whatever, uh, right here, pardon me, chapter, uh, what chapter are we on? Chapter eight, yeah, chapter eight, page 43, all right, and it says mutuality, coming out of Black's Law Dictionary, sixth edition, page 1021, all right, reciprocation, interchange, and acting by each of two parties and acting in return quote mutuality of contract means that obligation rests on each party to do or permit doing of something in consideration of other parties act or promise neither party being bound unless both are bound all right so getting with that in mind let me read chapter 25, the whole, a holy covenant of the Asiatic nation. Ye are the children of one father. And this is, this is uh, again, uh, chapter 25. If you want to follow along, Surah 1, verse 1. Ye are the children of one father, provided for by his care, and the breast of one mother have given you suck, or given ye suck. Let the bonds of affection, therefore, unite thee with thy brother's that peace and happiness may dwell in thy father's house 
And when ye separate in the world, remember the relation that bindeth you to love and unity and prefer not a stranger before thy own blood. If thy brother is in adversity, assist him. If thy sister is in trouble, forsake her not. So shall the fortunes of thy father contribute to the support of his whole race and his care be continued to you all in love to each other. Islam. Now it's chapter 25. All right. Of the uh, Morris Holy Quran, uh, the Morris Holy Temple of Science, Morris Science of America, Islam. So, with that in mind, all right. Keep in mind that more as more as we don't we don't you know place our trust so much in the words, but in the titles, and you know the history behind those titles, all right. And when we're talking about international exchange and intercourse and whatnot, um, let's just back up though before we before we get to that. Um, you know, there was some comments made uh, about the fact that if if you if you are claiming consular court, right? And they were using they were using the etymology of the word consul as the basis for this this argument, right? But unfortunately, so often we as a people do not know how to read, and that's why you know I'm so grateful that. You know, Taj goes over uh, the Edamon degree, right? And, you know, these very basic, basic, you know, reading skills, all right? And one thing that he's very good about doing is when you read a definition, he stops you and, and makes you recognize the whole, you know, all of what you're seeing, all right? And basic dictionary skills would, would have helped clear up a lot of the confusion that I was hearing, you know, going on and seeing going on, and I've been seeing going on. You know, lately, uh, but it says right here, and, I, and I'm using some of the same references they were referencing. Edamontonline.com, just for just for point of reference, it says late 14th century, one of the two chief magistrates in the Roman Republic, and I could I could find the same definition in the Black's Law Fourth Edition, which we we talked about last time, but it says one of the two chief magistrates in the Roman Republic. So already we're talking about somebody dealing with law, magistrates. That that's you know dealing with law and and actually administering the law all right or being uh in a position of of judgment all right over the law over cases and controversies all right comma from 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 indicating that 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 one came before the other from old french consule and directly Directly, meaning there's, there's no derivation and where it came from. It's not hard to figure it out. Directly from Latin. Consul. And then it says, quote, magistrate in ancient Rome, probably originally. So we, we know when we talk about connotation and denotation, when they're talking about the chief magistrates of Roman Republic, that's modern. That's a modern connotation of the word consul. It came from Old French, which consule. And that word consule directly comes from Latin. Consul. All right. Probably, originally, one who consults the Senate. Islam. So if we're talking about, you know, the Congress, you got the House of Representatives, which is, you know, made up of, of reps based on the population of the respective states or the parties that they, you know, the, the, the bodies politic they represent. And then you have the Senate. With the Senate, you know, they only get two people per state, all right? And and this this system of government is ancient, all right? It goes back here in, in Al Morocco, Northwest of Mexico, uh, Morocco, all right? Al Maghrib Al Aqsa, for those who, who don't know, who, who are confused about what we're talking about when we say Morocco, and, you know, uh, North America, just for, for you know, for commentator linguistics, all right? It goes back to the the five tribes, five six five tribes of the Iroquois Confederation, and what was known as the as the two party or the long house system, the two house system. Pardon me. All right. So you had one house that was made up similar to the to the the uh, House of Representatives, where each party, you know, each group or each tribe, each clan was able to send as many representatives as they needed based on the population of that clan. All right. And they would meet, you know, 
sometimes at Poverty Point, Louisiana, sometimes in other places throughout the nation, to uh, consult or consult with each other. All right. And if you had, if you have a problem, or uh, if there was some uh, violation of law between the parties, you would go to the Senate, or you would reach out to your senatorial representative. You know. Now you can you can reach out to both really, in the modern times, but we're just talking about in the context of the definition here. All right. So late 14th century. Then we got the old French, and then before that it was directly from Latin. Now, for those who do not know, the prophet and, and you know, history uh, indicates, and the prophet said, you know, if you're going to learn another language, learn Moorish Latin. Now, while in Moorish Latin, for those who don't know, is commonly known as Spanish. All right. Now, why, why is that? What's so important about Latin? Well, Latin is one of those Moorish languages that the Moors gave to not only others, but specifically to deal with commerce. All right. And again, going back to the treaty of peace and friendship of amity and commerce between the Moors and the European nations. All right. And now let's let's further let's further break this down. It says in modern usage. And, and again, they're talking about the modern usage, not the ancient. An agent appointed by a sovereign state to reside in a foreign place to protect the interests of its citizens and commerce there began with the use of, of the word as appellation of a representative chosen by a community of merchants living in a foreign country. Circa 1600s. Again, this is modern. We're talking about the modern connotations, not ancient. All right. This is an extended sense that, that developed 13th century in the Spanish form of the word. In French history, it refers to a title given to the three magistrates of the Republic after the dissolution of the Directory of 1799. All right, so you got to look at words not only in in uh, the defined context of, of what's being presented on the front end, but on the etymological basis of where the word derives its its origin or meaning from. All right, proper context. All right. Now let's just just just. Double check. Now, consular, because we're talking about the consular course. We didn't say just consul. We said consular. So consular is an adjective. All right. Same, same reference here to my online etymology dictionary. Early 15th century. Now, this is a modern connotation pertaining to a Roman consul. All right. From Latin. So the Romans got it from the Latin. All right. Which indicates the Moors. Now, and again, um, let's back up. Every, everywhere, all the land mass is one. We're talking about Asia. Moors are indigenous to the planet. Uh, Moors, in particular, are the founders of civilization all over the planet. So, please, someone, please tell me, what system of government do Europeans or Romans have that was not given or based off of Moorish culture? Hmm? Hmm? Please, please indicate to me, what, what, what culture do Europeans have? What civilization did they create that they did not already get? The blueprint for from the Moors. All right. And in specific, when you're talking about the Greeks and the Romans, you're talking about the, the Etruscans. All right. Saracens. All right. Or you're talking about the Ptolemy, you know, the Greek Ptolemy when they came in and invaded uh, Hakukta or modern day Egypt and, you know, learned from the mystery schools and the mystery systems what civilization, what government really was. Again, I ask those out there uh, what civilization did the Europeans create what what society what rules to govern nations did they actually create what are they the founders of Islam so going forward uh, it says Latin conciliaris of or pertaining to a consul from consul all right and then from 17th century which is again a modern Modern connotation says as pertaining to the office of a consul in the modern sense of in international law. All right. So when we take the ancient and the modern and, and we, you know, we, we consider all things consul generally is pertaining to the office of someone or dealing with international law. And again, keep in mind, we're already talking about these treaties, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship between the Moors and the Europeans. All right. You could put them on the other side. More is Europeans. More is Europeans. Either, either side. It don't really matter right now. We're just, just trying to get it thought through. All right. 
So, when we're looking at a Latin dictionary, all right, and it talks about consul, all right, there's several definitions here, several definitions here. Of course, you know, we got, we got to go to the end to see the beginning. So it says, uh, definitions, one, consul, highest elected Roman official, two years. Then it says, two, supreme magistrate elsewhere. Then another one, the verb, consulo, consulary, consuli, consultus, all right, third conjugation. It says, decide upon, adopt, look after, slash, out for, pay attention to, refer to Islam. And, you know, they were convoluting a lot of stuff, but we do know that the bays are the law enforcers, that the governors, all right, they're charged to know the law. But if, if there's not due process of law, again, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. So if the eels and the bays are not get, if the eels are not giving the law and the bays are not enforcing the law, the due process is not going to happen. All right. If the consular courts don't exist, where, 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 where? Please show me where on this land or in or in the current judicial system that Moors or Europeans can bring their controversies to to the the forefront to the public record and have them heard, arraigned, tried. All right, on a consistent basis. And not only not only do they get do they get a final judgment, but they can have that judgment enforced by that body. Islam, don't worry, I'll wait. I'll wait. Please tell me what what body does it on a consistent basis. All right. Now I know for a fact that the federal courts are supposed to be where where that happens, but most of the time Moors get their cases thrown out for whatever reason, you know. And I don't hear of too many Moors actually bringing charges and being able to fulfill those charges. You know, I don't think that's, I don't think it's justice that, that we file writs and then people just get fired or they retire, right? Um, and then they just go back home on their, you know, they go home and, and get to eat off of their pension. All right. Or that they're out here, you know, slaughtering wars left and right. And you have Asiatics who are supposed to be in leadership positions and saying, oh, well, they didn't claim their national and birthright, so you know they're they're subject to all the ills that this you know Rome wants to put on them. But the charge that we have is to uplift fallen humanity, to teach people under Act Six about their divine creed. Islam. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know I'm, I may I may be a little off on this, but uh, you know. We do have uh, a, a lot of things to consider here, all right? And do keep in mind that we did give these Europeans permission to do business on our, on our land, all right? Now, the fact that they, with that permission, that they decided to go pick up from Philadelphia and move to D.C., all right, to be closer to the ports, right? That, that kind of falls in line with what we were talking about earlier about the con case of controversy being brought at the port nearest to which... Um, or, you know, the port near to which the case of controversy happened or where the treaty was, was enacted, all right? And then you really don't understand the Buck Act and how that extends the federal jurisdiction, you know, over the rest of the states. Creating this, this, hold on. Islam, so we're back. Let me just read it again. Where provisions are not made to address foreign relations and intercourse in a consular court as prescribed by law, then no jurisdiction exists. A court of general sessions congressionally sanctioned in accord with the national constitutions and treaties with consulars and officials representing both nations slash nationals present and in proper persona would be a proper jurisdiction. All parties who operate by de jure constitutional law and treaty law. All parties would operate by de jure constitutional and treaty law. Pardon me. Uh, if there is no proper jurisdiction or venue, then no lawful or legal trial can be held. Therefore, all rights revert back to the people, self-government with sovereign authority. This is where Certificate AA-22141 clearly proves its purpose. When, so when government officials supersede their jurisdiction, comma, or deny lawful due process, redress, recourse, and remedy, quote, at law, then they are the criminals and are traitors to the Constitution and treaty to which they are bound by law and from whence they derive any authority at all. All right. This is where your Zodiac Constitution comes into effect. Use it. 
Islam wars. All right, it keeps it goes on. It says the Treaty of 1787 is the law of the land, just as the Constitution, and is binding on all judges of every state. Look at them as one document. Talking about the Constitution and the treaties. All right. As far as law and authority is concerned, Moors are not citizens of the Union State Society, but are the people of the continental United States, being a part or being part and parcel, all right, of the government to which the Union of States are obligated. All right. So with that being said, if, if Moors are not citizens of the Union State Society, but are in fact part and parcel of the people of the continental United States being part and parcel of the said government, and we know for a fact that the Moors uh, have an obligation based on that treaty to make and enforce the law, but then, you know, the law that we've given the Europeans, they are not fulfilling. It would be asinine of us to think that the European who is continuously suppressing us is going to hail us into courts, you know, populated and, and uh, you know, to be passed judgment by a jury of our own peers. It's asinine to think that, all right? And it's even more asinine to think that the European is going to be just in his ruling when we have a certain obligation to uphold and enforce the law on our own, all right? We the people, to form a more perfect union, all right? I ain't going to go into all of that right now. But anyway, keep going. The constitutions of the two nations in conjunction with treaties are the work, and let me pause for the cause it's not asinine if, if that's all if the, that if that is the best that you can do all right and if you refuse or don't know how to go ask those who know the law and get a favorable reply you know then i don't know what to say right now like you got to study 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 like if that's where you're at right now then that's where you at you you gotta you gotta spend some time you gotta spend some more time with this information you know you still got some persian to do in terms of your concepts and you know we all really do it's a continuous process it's not it's not like it's a process that ever really ends because we all were born in sin or ignorance all right um there's very few of us who were born in, in into you know the moorish paradigm and the moorish mindset all right much less the mindset of of making and enforcing the law being the eels and bays and you know running government and the prophet said i'll keep the european here long enough to teach you government and he's going to keep some of these europeans because some of them are good farmers he said the prophet said he like he like good peas. You know what I mean? But I, I digress. I'm just, you know, paraphrasing here. But we're still on page nine, lesson book 14, A1. It says the constitutions of the two nations in conjunction with treaties are the working tools for adjudication in jurisdictional arguments, procedures, and venue. Keep in mind the duality of the great seal of the United States. With Moore's any non-federal sanctioned court inferior or inferior court is in proper jurisdiction. If a court is not operating with constitutional law and treaty, it is color of law and fraudulent. Islam, any colorable courts are improper and have no jurisdiction, although most all states officers knowingly operate with color of authority. Islam, any colorable or negative law Non-organic constitution is in blatant violation of the Constitution and the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787. Moors, when dealing with legal or lawful matters, always be aware of what law, court, or venue is in operation and what law its officers are claiming authority by. The nation they represent and knowing the difference. Always challenge the court's jurisdiction. All right. When or if Moors are in court of the United States, and this is page 10, are in courts of the United States of America for any reason, the courts and their officers should be made aware of their obligation to the Constitution and the Treaty of 1787 for the record. All Moors Americans should refer to their Zodiac Constitution, remembering that they are not the property, wards, slaves of the states and not not, I repeat, not Negro, Black, Colored, ETC, or any other brand names that allude to slavery. And be careful, Moors, because some, some of your own interpreters and feds will try to put you back into slavery. Islam, be very, 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 very careful. 
Make sure that you study, study, study like all of them say. And like the prophet said. But when you study, 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 you got to apply these studies. Otherwise, you get rusted. You follow me? If you don't use it, you lose it. We're just talking about in general. All right. But going on, it says as national sovereign people. All right. Not not individuals, but a sovereign people, a national sovereign people encompassing the entire nation. All of Morocco. The Moors are entitled to lawful due process at law. And again, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. All right. Take it, take it, take the knife out a little bit. That's not justice. All right. It has to be lawful due process. The constitutions of all parties involved should be presented into evidence for the record to protect and to preserve the rights of the people. Islam, the constitutions, and treaty law is the sovereign law where any de jure claimed authority is derived. Islam, so if anybody's claiming authority and they're not dealing with these constitutions and the treaty, then we already know inherently that their authority is not de jure and in fact is de facto. Islam, the rights of all people, citizens of a nation are protected by the written constitution of that particular nation not by privileges. Islam, the people's sovereignty is the source of the constitution and treaty law. Constitutional law, the people's combined sovereign power of authority is enforced by their national representatives. Islam, through government agencies, and y'all can, can look at it for yourself, page 10, you know, take a screenshot, do what you gotta do. I'm not making this up. This this is a very old document. This is over 20 years old, mind you. This lesson book 1481 is 20 is over 20 years old. And from anyway, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna leave it there for right now. But notice what it says here. It says the rights of all people, citizens of a nation, are protected by the written constitution. And again, a lot of these people can't read of that particular nation, not by privileges. It's not how I feel today. All right, it's not just on my personal whim. We're talking about the con the written constitution. We have to deal with what it says in the constitution. Every state, when it says every state, on Article 4, Section 4, is guaranteed a Republican form of government. What does that mean? What does that look like? All right, and when that is violated, what are the, what are the policies or procedures of the courts or tribunals? What are the protocols of the Moors? All right, of those who claim to know the law, of those within the temple, the Grand Sheets and Secrecies, all right, to enforce those laws or those rights so that that Republican form of government is guaranteed to all. All right. What does that look like <laughs> based on that written constitution? This is a real this is a real question. All right. The people's sovereignty is the source of the constitution and treaty law. Constitutional law, the people's Combined sovereign power of authority is enforced by their national representatives through government agencies and sub-agencies. Islam, all lawful agencies of government must have a delegation of authority order from the Congress or the House of Parliament, Majlis. To the Dejima, Council of Elders, the representative ruling body of the two nations in one, demand all agency officials to produce their delegation of authority when they put demands on you. Islam, lawful government does not and cannot mandate anything on the people. Government authority and power is limited by the Constitution. Governments are empowered to protect the rights of the people, not use authority or sovereignty allotted them through the Constitution to violate the same. This is why Moors have a written constitution for their protection in national and international affairs, linking themselves back with the families of nations. All right. And, and let me just reiterate what, what a lot of these haters and naysayers did not mention. All right. So when you're talking about the, uh, the organization of American states. All right or the OAS, 
recognize that the U dot S dot is is a quasi you know party to a lot of these treaties, but where the where the rubber meets the mold, road, pardon me, and where the buck stops, similar to how it how they do with the ICC and the UN, because they are what's known as a member state. All right, and they claim that they're you know that that their government and their society is so advanced. You know, they, they have certain leeway that allows them to back out of certain agreements. And whenever a member state vetoes, all right, a particular resolution, that member state, that member state's veto is effective across the board and, and is effective as if it was two thirds of the UN making the vote, similar to how the Congress is set up. All right. And like the, the president can, you know, have veto power. All right. There's got to be checks and balances. All right. But if you don't have the executive power, the legislative and the judicial power is clearly defined, all right? And if everybody's not clearly operating within their limited jurisdiction, then you have anarchy, you have confusion, all right? And typically where that where anarchy and confusion is, violations of people's rights are not far behind. Islam. So and and you know, with that violation, we also are dealing with a color of law. You know, we're dealing with color of law, right? So furthermore, going on page 10, this is color of law, artificial, used to control Negro, black, and colored people, artificial. All right, keep in mind, so they're using an artificial law to control the artificial people. All right, so when are the real Moors, when are the real people going to stand up and be themselves? Islam, keep in mind, realize you got to learn to be yourselves again. All right, because we, you know, we've been reduced to servitude and slavery for so long. You know, a lot of us got Stockholm syndrome. We really think that this European has, has got our best interests in mind. You know, we really do. Some of us really think that, that they're gonna help us out, and that they got, they really are gonna, you know, do what they're supposed to do. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about all Europeans, because some Europeans are actually assisting the Moors. They are actually, you know, taking their places amongst the affairs of men, and you know, disseminating the information. They're talking about the prophet. All right. Um, and you can look on my channel to see, you know, some of the Europeans that I'm talking about. Um, but uh, I just want to keep 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 things in perspective here. All right. Keep in mind the political, social and civic danger of using and alluding to the Union States brand names of Negro, black, colored ETC. So whenever a more whenever a more American is trying to, you know, uh, be you know jokingly or or seriously denationalizing Moors by calling them Negroes. That's a supreme violation, not only against that individual but against the the body as a whole. And it's even more of a supreme violation when when these words and these actions and these deeds are coming from people who are in quote unquote positions of power and authority. All right, it's a supreme violation. Supreme violation. They're practicing color of law because they're using those same colorable, you know, labels, brand names, slave labels on their own people. Denationalizing them. And they have not, for the record, placed any writs or affidavits on the record rebutting your claim of being a national point for point. All right. And if it keeps up. They just might fall into default. All right. And for those who don't know already, go go check out the little call schedule page to see, you know, just just get an idea or clue um, what the damages may be on a, just for a civil on the civil end of things. We're not even talking criminal right now. We're just talking about civil damages. All right. Uh, so, you know, be careful. Be very careful, Moors, because culture is in the language. All right. The European surnames, which denote possession, and we had a lot of Moors, you know, who was asking questions. All right, you know, I'm nationalizing, I'm doing my name, declaration and correction. Can I just keep the name that I've been given? You know, and it, and it's it's kind of like, uh, yeah, you can, you have the right to, but once you you come to fruition and knowledge of knowing yourself and knowing what these European surnames really mean, that they're really brand names that denote possession. I don't think you want to carry them with your Moorish Appalachian. I don't think you want to mix that with your Moorish Appalachian. You know, uh, oil and water, you know, oil and water don't mix <laughs> too well. 
but I digress. Anyway, uh, the European surnames which are no possessions such as Smith, Jones, Johnson, ETC must be returned to the European nations. All right. These names are not of Moorish Asiatic parentage. Claim your own Moorish names and nationality at all times. All right. And this is why, you know, this is why we, 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 we caution against that. De facto government officials and the state's judges, prosecutors, and state agencies operate with color of law and anti-constitutional statutes and ordinances to extract, extort, finance from the unsuspecting state wards shadow. All right. So if you're still carrying the slave brand warship names, they still have, you know, an arguable uh, basis to claim that you are still their property. All right. And if they're claiming you as their property, they're going to take what's theirs. <laughs> All right, Islam. So, furthermore, it says any branch of government. Notice it says branches. Government is not it's not inherent in one party or one uh, body, one office. It's spread out. Again, checks and balances. Islam, and then there's sub agencies and subgroups and whatnot that operate under those three main branches. All right, legislative, judicial, executive. All right. Keep that in mind. Any branch of government, government agency slash agencies, person or persons employed by such agencies, all right, who operate beyond its or their jurisdiction or delegation of authority is in violation of the Constitution and the treaty. So whatever their job title is, if it only says they're supposed to be a window washer and they out here mopping the floors, well, that, that you know, that's outside of your delegated authority. All right? If, if you're a policy enforcer or armed mercenary, and you're only supposed to, you know, come to a scene of a crime when you've been called to it. But instead, you're over here speed trapping, you know. And you might be outside of your de uh, delegation of authority. You know, I'm, I might need to see what, what you were uh, delegated and what your limits were in terms of being out here and doing business on my land. I, I need to see that in writing just so that we're all clear because you're telling it to me. You're saying that you're Sharif. You're saying that you're a deputy you know, whatever, that does not in, in, inherently prove to me what uh, authority you were given. That doesn't give me a full description. It doesn't, you know, it may only be an out, it might not even be an outline, to be honest. All right. Officials using color of authority violate the people slash citizen, thus commit a criminal offense. In such instances, the ultra virus statutes do not protect the culpable officials or employees. All right? When you're talking about ultra-virus, that's when you start getting into Clearfield. All right? In Clearfield Doctrine, we talked about that. We're not going to get into that today. Uh, you know, but email us if you got questions. Contracted agencies, non-government, municipalities, judges, prosecutors, person, or persons, clerks, ETC, or others employed by such agencies, municipalities, ETC, are bound to uphold and support the Constitution. Islam, and the next section goes into the Bar Association, talking about the judges and the lawyers and how they're all, um, it says, remember this, the state's judges are members of the Bar Association, all right? The state's prosecutors are members of the Bar Association. The state's lawyers and attorneys are members of the Bar Association. The state's judges methodically use threats, fear, and coercion to force people to hire their fellow Bar Association lawyers and attorneys. All right. Already right there. If everybody's a part of the bar and, you know, there's supposed to be a separation of powers, the judge is supposed to be non-partial. Um, don't we have a conflict of interest here? Just inherently? How, how often do Moors make, make a point of this, though? How often do they, do they you know, uh, object to this and preserve this, this uh, claim or issue for appeal? Just a thought, you know. Islam... Um, but it goes on to say, question, for whom are the state's judges working? Whose agents are they, the bar associations or the people's? The bar association is not the law. The Constitution is the people's law. Study the law and use the law. All right? The bar association is not a law. It's not the law. It's an association. You follow me? The bar association is not the Congress. It's an association. All right? The bar association is not the president or the executive authority. It is an association, all right, similar to a, a, a trade union, 
all right? They're, they're organized because they're similarly situated based on uh, a particular type of work, Islam, or trade in commerce, all right? And if it's commercial in nature, automatically uh, its auspices or its, or its jurisdiction at some point is going to fall in line under that treaty because we're talking about a treaty of amity and commerce. All right. So it had it, you know, whatever, whatever anybody's doing in commerce, it cannot supersede or violate that treaty and the Constitution. All right. And for the sake of conversation, uh, don't they call themselves esquires? Isn't that an English title indicative of the crown in, in England under the Queen of England? All right. Into the Bar Association, short for Barristers Association. All right. And when you talk about the, the, the title of Esquire, that's the title right below a knight. Islam. So it is it is a foreign, foreign title of nobility that one has taken on for themselves in contradiction to the Constitution. You know, caveat in tour, buyer beware. All right. If you are wise, you will claim your Moorish nationality. And I said this to all Asiatics. If you are wise, you will claim your Moorish nationality and your sovereign rights. Wearing them like a warm coat in the winter season. Use your Moorish Great Seal Zodiac Constitution. The state's judges, prosecutors, and lawyers are not the keepers or protectors of constitutional law. So why, why are Moors leaving everything up to them? Why are they not, in fact, instituting and uh, constituting their own courts in whatever form or fashion they think is, is most, most beneficial uh, to them or most advantageous to their uh, body politic, their style of government, what have you? Why are they not doing that? As long it's just, just, just some questions I got, you know, and if they're not going to do it, why are they criticizing those who are trying to do the work? While sitting on the sidelines, you know, laughing, kiki, ha ha, ha ha, you wrong, you so wrong. You know, if it's so wrong, then just wait for me to fail. You don't have to try to accelerate it. It's, it's going to fail in its own regard, you know. If it's truth, it's going to stand. If it's falsehood, it's not going to stand, pure and simple. It's going to fall, like I said. You know, there's, there's no need for you to debase yourself, to get out of character, you know to disrespect anyone, to slander them, to make libelous statements against them. There's no need for that. You know, you're only setting yourself up for failure at that point. You know, you're creating your own hell, all right, which really is just, you know, and, and bench means bank, and hell is, is the exchequer's chamber, you know, it's, it's the place where they put you under the exchequer's chamber, under, under the bench, and realize that, you know, you're going to these tribunals, they're just really doing banking, you know, so you need to have you do need to have an understanding of accounting, all right, finance, all right, <laughs> basic business concepts, things of that sort. You know how how do all these things work? How do they work together? How do they, how do they work? You know, in violation of the Constitution, or how do they not work in violation of the Constitution? You know what happens when there is a violation? You know what work must be done, all right, to preserve those rights or to extend those rights where necessary. All right. If if Moors are not coming coming together and they're not talking about these things in an honest and uh, you know caring manner, then we're going to continue this cycle of of uh, you know ignorance. All right. So it goes on to say the state's judges. Let me read this again. The state's judges, prosecutors, and lawyers are not the keepers or protectors of constitutional law. They do not represent the people. They are of a private guild that actually subverts the Constitution and inject themselves as the law. They are all members of a private, non-government, non-government exclusive club acting as if they are the law. This is a clear case of conflict of interest, is what I was saying before. Can such operatives render a fair trial to anyone? Definitely not a more. They have no lawful jurisdiction. So if the, if the judges don't have any lawful jurisdiction, the prosecutors, the quote-unquote lawyers don't have any jurisdiction, all right? And the Council Court has been, the, the jurisdiction of the Council Court has been relinquished back to Morocco. All right. Meaning that Moors have the rights to enact their own courts. All right. And it would behoove them to deal with the Council Courts because that is where issues and controversies of diversity 
are dealt with in specific diversity and issues of commerce. All right. So you're looking at the uh, Trading with the Enemy Act. All right. There's certain things that the Europeans themselves cannot do. Because in, in under Trading with the Enemy Act, they would be acting against their own interest. All right. When you look at uh, Marbury versus Madison and the McIntosh case. All right. They were not going to give the landowner who got his uh, who got his deed or his title of, of a state from the chief from the from native Indian you know Moore's chief the Indian chief you know what they what they called him in the in the case um, but he can't you know the judge can't rule in his favor even though he you know that's that's the sovereign power that we have to you know that we have to respect and we are in treaty relation with and even though you know you did get to them first all right if we hope to establish what we plan to establish being the subversion of that constitution, being the subversion of that treaty, all right, I have to rule in favor of, of this individual, the other landowner, who got his deed from the county or the newly established uh, city, state. All right? And when you see Marbury versus Madison, they basically say that, you know, we're, we're not... We're not the final court because, you know, we're final. We're final because we are giving the final judgments. We're not just final because we say we are. We're final, we're final because that's what it is based on the Constitution and based on the separation of powers. All right. It's the magistrates or the judges who decide the interpretation or the application of the law. The Congress and the Senate write the law. All right. They can give guidance. They can create common law, and that's what they did when they when they enacted AA22141. They relinquished jurisdiction of the United States in Morocco back to the Moors. Islam. So at what point are the Moors gonna take their places amongst the affairs of men? I asked rhetorically. I'll wait. Don't worry. We're doing it. And when you're ready, you can go to FedsProvinceRegency.org, check out the Council Court Restoration page. Download your copy of the juror questionnaire. Make sure you read that prologue because the prologue is very important. Very, 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 very important. All right. And I might give some highlights today or we might get into it next class. But um, I just want you guys to keep in mind that we have a government, Moors, but we have to take our places amongst the, amongst the affairs of men within it. All right. If we, if we do not take our places, then... We're not holding our end of the bargain. We're not, we're not, we're not on our square, truly, Islam. And if that is the case, if we're not going to step up, then, you know, the rest of the world is waiting on, which the, way, the rest of the world is waiting on us to do, they're, they're not going to be so patient with us. All right? And let me just pause for the calls. And we're back. And I just wanted to reiterate um, something about the OAS you know, that I forgot. When you're talking about this organization of American states, you, you have to keep in mind, um, similar to like the Panama Canal case, the indigenous peoples of the Panama Canal su sought to sue and file a claim against, you know, the Panamanian government and the U.I.S. government for taking their, you know, unlawfully taking their land, their, their sacred land and converting it. To what they wanted to in terms of you know dredging the Panama Canal and whatnot. And this is one of the biggest cases, you know, of the OAS. But part of what came out of that case, um, and based on what happened around the time when it was still the League of Nations and, and whatnot during the Prophet's time, all right, after he got the land mandate, they jumped out of the, the uh the agreement and they basically stopped any other nation from being able to bring suit to them other than bringing the suit to them through their courts and of course we already know how people get you know how people get railroaded and especially if you're foreign you get railroaded dealing with these quote unquote American tribunals alright so again it would behoove the Moors who are found all over this nation all over this world and we know that Moors are found all over the world alright and we know that the empire is not just in Northwest Mexico it's South Central and adjoining islands alright these Moors, these, these, our brethren and sisters, all right, don't they deserve due process? 
Hmm. Do they not deserve to have a platform by which they can bring their claims and grievances? Whether they have a grievance against the Moroccan Empire or the U.S. dot, don't they deserve their day in court? All right. If a more injures another more, who decides? If a more injures the European, who decides? All right, we know the European is going to try to hail you into their courts, but who really is supposed to have the jurisdiction to decide if there is no council court, which is the proper jurisdiction, to deal with diversity of issues? All right. And if, a, and you know, God, you know, heaven forbid, if a Moor violates a European, which just outright violates them, how is that European gonna, gonna get remedy? All right? And again, backing up to these foreigners, how, how are our brothers and sisters all around the world supposed to get remedy when we know that the U.S. courts are not offering that platform? All right? They're not, they're not you know, putting their, their case in controversy between the, before a jury of their own peers. Like, let's, let's really think this thing through. Who does it benefit not to have the consular courts? Really? And I'll leave you guys with that. And um, so from there, you know, I just want, I just want to leave y'all with that. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get back into this later. We'll pick it up. We'll pick this up again later. Pretty soon. Very soon. Very, very, very soon. All right. Um, as well as other things, questions and comments, but I, I don't want to get you guys too far down the rabbit hole today. I really want y'all to, you know, to take the bite-sized chunks, uh, 